Hi, everybody. It's great to see you today. Um, I'll start off by saying go Bears. I'm a two-time Cal grad, so I feel a little weird being here. Um, yeah, I know, right? Somebody else from, from Cal. Yay. Um, I, as, as noted, my name is Lisa Soon, and I've been working at this intersection of technology and health really since the 80s. And um, it's very exciting to see the progress that's been made in some ways. And in other ways, it's a little alarming, because I think at times we forget that the point of this is really to take care of patients. And so I, I wanted to start off today being a little contrarian and talk about, about that issue, um, keeping patients at the heart of digital health. So when I think about this topic and, and what healthcare is like for people, I think about what it's like when you're turning on the NBA playoff game and your cable doesn't work and you you know, kick the TV and you bang on it and you, you know, turn things on and off and you move wires around, but in the end, you got to call the cable company. And when you call the cable company, whoops, when you call the cable company and you get this guy, and they ask you all your, you know, information a million times over, they transfer you around, you're confused by what they're telling you, it still doesn't work, in the end you don't get what you wish, but you do get offered a new, you know, HBO uh, uh, subscription. And I think it's really interesting to note that the only industry that in most brand surveys comes up worse than cable TV is healthcare, and that is a fact. Um, I see you know, hundreds, even thousands of companies every year focused on every, you know, everything around healthcare and technology and its combination thereof. And one of the, you know, and I saw today even that the, um, CB Insights, the publication that a lot of us venture people look at and entrepreneurs as well, uh, did a study or did a, an article where they, were, they talked about 100 AI in healthcare companies and missed at least a couple dozen that I can think of off the top of my head. And those companies collectively have raised almost $4 billion in venture capital over the last five years. That is a stunning thing. And you know what concerns me about it is that we've become so enamored of the coolness of technology that we sometimes forget that the point of it is really to take care of people. So I know I'm here at Stanford, I know I'm in the middle of Silicon Valley and it's you know, the tech people and, and all that, and you're probably gonna throw rocks at me, but you know, I think that in the end, technology here is only a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. And I think we spend way too much time you know, with confusing, um, bizarre applications of technology that really doesn't advance the interests of the patient. And so I think what's really cool is figuring out how to use the technology to actually make a difference for people. So I mean, you know, I think the reason people are excited about, for instance, what Amazon and Walmart have announced they are doing is because people like going to or using Amazon and Walmart. How many people in this room like going to the hospital or calling their health insurer? Yeah, that's the response I would have expected. So, you know, but, but using Amazon is pleasurable, relatively. And, you know, I think that's why it inspires the imagination for people when we hear about these companies that are good at patient experience, or consumer experience, excuse me, thinking about getting into healthcare because the patient experience has just been so poor. Digital health, you know, is an interesting phenomenon. It's, you know, this term that's of art that's come about probably in the last six or seven years. Um, it used to mean just, it used to be called just healthcare technology. I mean, back when, you know, Al Gore was inventing the internet and I was starting working in this, er in this area, um, we didn't have that kind of cool moniker for it. And it's one that I don't even really like that much because I think, you know, by and large, we don't call other industries digital transportation. You know, we don't call it digital manufacturing, when you integrate technology into a factory. We call it manufacturing, right? And I think we have to be getting um, to a place in, tech in healthcare where we'll, we're comfortable with technology as just part of the expected process to make things better, but not the purpose and the end of itself. So the conference, conveniently noted here, is, is focused on predict, prevent, cure precisely. So I thought what I might do as a starter, since I'm the first speaker in this group, um, which is great, because I wouldn't want to follow these people, um, is talk about how some digital health companies have used technology for the patient's benefit in those four categories. So I'm going to start with a company called Arteris, which was actually founded here 
by a group of Stanford professionals, including Shreyas Vasanawala. And Arteris is a company that does digital analytics uh, around imaging. So AI applied to imaging. They're actually the first healthcare company that got an AI FDA approval. And one of the things that's pretty cool about what they do is that by doing, by applying technology to the image reading, you know, they're not aiming to put radiologists out of business. They're aiming to help radiologists focus on medical practice and not do repetitive, annoying things that sometimes result in not accurate outcomes. So their analytics approach is to uh, let the medical judgment prevail and to provide more accurate information to get faster, you know, and more precise information to patients and providers. That is a really clear, I think, line between how to use technology to make things better. You know, among the things that they can do is shorten the time in the imaging uh, machine, which if you're a baby or an older person is really important, you know, from a patient experience standpoint. So I think that's a great application of technology to healthcare. On the prevent side, there's a company called Health Reveal that I really like. It's a company that uses streams of data, both real time and near real time and not exactly real time, but brings them together for the purpose of prescriptive analytics. And what they're really trying to do, if you think about like your credit card fraud detection software that's running all the time, you're wandering around with your wallet, and somebody calls you and says, hey, we've detected that maybe somebody's using your credit card. Well, that's exactly what Health Reveal is doing, but they're looking at your data and saying, hey, I'm worried you might be having a stroke pretty soon. Because if you think about, for instance, the people who have been um, diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, about 50% of them are not anticoagulated, and a large number of those 50% who aren't should be. And so the technology is used to help doctors identify the patients that are, missed, are, are out of sync with best evidence, you know, best practices, evidence-based medicine, as defined by the many uh, you know, august bodies that, pr that publish those, those uh, guidelines, and notifying the doctor and or the patient about that so they can act quickly. Um, the cure side of things, that's always a little bit hard to, you know, describe because cure is a difficult concept. But even in cancer and oncology, there's a company called PsyOps out there, many of you may know, which is focused on using data and through digital delivery to the physician, combining genomics, EHR data, and other data to help think about more, um, better patient matching to treatment. And they do it you know, at the bedside, in, in the moment, in helping you know, determine what the best treatment for the patients with cancer are, and the result of that has been significantly improved progression-free survival for patients who've been in, you know, in that group versus control groups and studies they've done. So again, very straight line between how you use technology and data to improve outcomes for people. And on the precisely front, you know, and I, that term is so interesting to me because the, you know, is it precision medicine or precision health or personalized, I don't know, it's all those things, but the idea that you can get the right amount of care to the right people at the right time in the right form is so important. And today, as we all know, most of the work done on product development, whether it's drugs or devices or whatever, is done in clinics, you know, very constrained clinical trials where it really doesn't take into account what's happening to the patient in real life. And so there's a company called Evidation, which was also spun out of Stanford, uh, which collects through virtual um, clinical trial you know, visits, real world evidence, whether it's delivered by the patient through information you know, exchange or from the exhaustive digital devices with your clinical grade or, or consumer grade, to bring into the clinical trial process to ensure that uh, there's a clear understanding of how the drug or device or what have you is operating in the real life experience of the patient. Because while it, you know, too many of these cures that we come up with, or treatments that we come up with, are clinically effective, but you know, are not effective in the life, you know, in improving the life of the people who have to use them. So that idea of putting the patient at the center to me, kind of think about it like this. You remember that, that owl guy? I mean, probably most of you are too young. Some of you are too young. To, some of you are old enough to remember the owl guy from the Tootsie Pops. I can see some of you, I know you're old enough. Um, and I think it's important to think that the, the patient isn't a component of digital health, it's the point of digital health. At least with respect to the stuff that's clinical, right? And obviously there's some stuff that's administrative that may not be so, so relevant here, but anything that's gonna impact how care is delivered really needs to be patient first. 
And you know, if you think about the Tootsie Roll and how many licks does it get to the middle, it shouldn't be a lot before you get to the Tootsie Roll center, which is the patient. The lollipop's nice and all, but everybody knows what you want to do is get to the Tootsie Pop. And so it's important that we as healthcare people embrace this ideal of delightful and quality patient experience if we're really going to use technology to advantage. Otherwise, it's pretty much all for naught. So that was really my talk today. I wanted to set the, set the groundwork uh, for the rest of the speakers. I think you know there's a lot of promise in this combination of tech, and I don't mean to sound um, too negative about it, but I just, you know, I, I sit there in this office, right, and I see company after company after company after company pitching me for money, and I have never, uh, I'm never surprised when I ask the question, how many patients have you talked to about this? And they say none. It happens almost every day. And I think that's sad and wrong, you know, that we really need to be thinking about how the experience in the end improves healthcare. And the people who are receiving the health care are the patients. So I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. And I will turn it back over. Great.